today on the Perception in Action podcast. Can non-invasive brain stimulation be used to enhance acquisition, performance, and retention of sports skills? What exactly are TMS, TCS, and TDCS? Are products like Halo Sport worth your investment? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, the second part in my two-part series looking at neuroscience technologies for sports training. Back in episode 106, I looked at the use of neural feedback for sports training concluding that there's not really enough evidence yet to support its effectiveness for sports. Today, I want to look at another type of training that has become very popular recently, non-invasive brain stimulation. Brain stimulation can be grouped into two broad categories. The first category involves using magnetic fields to stimulate the brain, the most common of which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. TMS involves the discharge of brief magnetic pulses through a stimulating coil that is held against the subject's head. This rapidly changing magnetic field induces electrical currents in the brain tissue near to the center of the coil. The immediate effect of this is to generate action potentials in those cells, or in other words, bursts of brain activity, followed by a refractory period as the cell recovers. The main advantage of TMS over other methods is that it's a very precise and focal technique. That is, you can target specific areas of the brain. However, it has several disadvantages with regards to its use for sports training. It's expensive, not portable, and can be difficult to use. For these reasons, I'm going to primarily focus on the other category of brain stimulation today, those which involve using electrical currents. Transcranial current stimulation, or TCS, comes in two common variants. Transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, involves passing a weak electrical current from a negative electrode, a cathode, to a positive electrode, an anode. The magnitude and polarity of the electric field at the brain surface near the electrodes determines its effect. Cells in the vicinity of the anode will tend to increase in excitability, while cells near the cathode become less active through the same process. Transcranial alternating current, or TACS, uses a similar principle, except that the current alternates at a specific frequency. Researchers typically apply TACS with a frequency related to some of the EEG bands that I discussed back in episode 106, for example, the sensory motor rhythm. The idea is to try to put the brain into one of these states. The magnitude of current used in these systems is typically very small, on the order of 1 to 2 milliamps, and is applied for about 10 to 20 minutes. TCS has many advantages over TMS. It is cheap, portable, and easy to use. There are several videos you can find online on how to make your own system. Please don't do this. The main disadvantage of it is that it's less focal technique with the stimulation affecting a larger area of the brain. Although both TMS and TCS are very safe when used properly, TCS also has an advantage here. There have been incidents of TMS inducing seizures, with no such cases being reported yet for TCS. Part of this may be due to how long each of these technologies has been used. While TMS has been employed for over 20 years, TCS is a relatively new technology. TMS and TCS can be used to do two distinctly different things. Application of TMS can be used to disrupt activity in a particular region of the brain, essentially inducing a temporary lesion. This technique has been used in many studies to investigate the role of different brain areas in different functions. The logic here is, if we disable an area with TMS and you get worse at something, that area must have been involved. The other approach that is more relevant to training is using brain stimulation to induce brain plasticity. Both TMS and TCS can be used for this purpose. The idea is that by modulating the level of excitation and or inhibition in the brain, it makes it more receptive when learning new skills. For example, it may make it easier to make new connections between neurons or consolidate motor memories. In the acute phase following stimulation, Participants have demonstrated enhanced motor skills including improved time to fatigue and faster response times. 
The effect of TDCS is maximal shortly after the end of stimulation and declines over roughly a 20 to 60 minute period, depending on the stimulation parameters. One of the problems in this area is that we know very little about the nature of this plasticity state induced by TCS, and it seems to depend on a host of different factors, including age, attention, sex, physiological state, genetics, and the time of day. As I will dive into more detail in a few minutes, in motor learning research and training, typically TCS is used to stimulate neurons in the primary motor cortex, often called M1, or in the cerebellum. The most popular commercial system is the Halo Sport. If you haven't seen it before, Halo Sport looks like a regular pair of headphones, but inside there are a set of electrodes which use TDCS to stimulate the motor cortex. To quote their advertising, what Halo Sport essentially does is accelerates the motor learning that results from physical practice. What we ask athletes to do is wear Halo Sport for 20 minutes before their training session. Those 20 minutes of neural stimulation of the motor cortex will induce a temporary state of what neuroscientists call hyperplasticity, or you can think of it as hyperlearning. End quote. Along with the primary question of whether this works or not, which I'll get to in a second, there are a host of other issues that arise when considering the use of brain stimulation in sports. One of the main ones is, should it be allowed? Or should it be considered a type of neurodoping? One can imagine one day where athletes take a hit of TDCS right before they walk onto the field like you would with a drug. For those interested in these type of issues, I would highly recommend the article by Nick Davis from 2013. For those interested in more information on brain stimulation technologies and techniques, I would highly recommend the primer by Parkin et al. published in 2015. Links for both of these are in the show notes. Okay, so what does the research have to say about the idea that brain stimulation, specifically TDCS, can be used to enhance motor learning and performance in sports? Today I'm going to look at a couple recent review articles that have addressed this. In 2016, Amon and colleagues published a mini-review examining the use of TDCS for, to improve motor learning. In this review, the authors first point out the importance of distinguishing between two types of potential usages, immediate ones related to the change in excitation of neurons and longer-term effects related to changes in the protein structure in the brain. These longer-term effects seem to be related to changes in the NMDA and GABA receptors within the brain. In reviewing these studies that investigated motor learning, the authors note that three primary tasks have been used all of which I've talked about on the podcast a few times now. The serial reaction time task, which involves learning to press keys in a certain order. The visual isometric pinch task, which involves learning to produce a precise amount of force with the fingers. And the visual motor rotation task, which involves learning to adapt one's movements to some type of distortion of the perceptual motor space. For example, your target is rotated by 30 degrees after you start moving. For these tasks, TDCS has been either applied when the participant is actually practicing the task or while they're at rest either before or between training sessions. Applying TDCS over the motor cortex during training has been shown to have several performance benefits, including faster reaction times and better retention for the serial reaction time test, better accuracy for the force pinch task, and better retention in the visual motor rotation task. TDCS applied over the cerebellum during practice has been shown to result in faster adaptation to new rotations. As I will discuss in more detail in a moment, results for TDCS before and between training sessions are much less consistent, although there is some evidence that it may help with consolidation. From this review, the authors conclude, quote, Although more investigations are needed to provide a better understanding of the effects induced by TDCS, its impact on motor learning and use for exploring neural substrates underlying motor learning has been successfully demonstrated. In other words, the potential of this technique for basic studies and future clinical treatments seems promising. Unquote. A more complete review and meta-analysis was conducted by Bush and colleagues in 2017. For this review, the authors looked at the potential effect of TDCS for three different aspects of motor learning. Online performance during practice, offline learning and retention, and adaptation. In this type of research, the typical control condition involves using a sham stimulation group. That is, a group of participants that is fully kitted up with the stimulation equipment and are told they will receive the stimulation, but nothing actually happens. 
Consistent with what I've just discussed, the studies the authors reviewed showed fairly consistent benefits of applying TDCS over the primary motor cortex, M1, or cerebellum during practice. Again, these studies primarily involve sequence learning for key press tasks. Interestingly, in the review, they found that stimulation over M1 prior to training actually led to a decrease in learning rates. This will be an important point I will emphasize in a moment. In terms of offline learning, studies measuring performance in the pinch task over five consecutive days have shown that TDCS applied over M1 during practice resulted in significantly greater offline gains between days and better retention. However, it's again important to emphasize this only worked when the stimulation was given concurrently with training. If it was applied post-training, there was no offline skill gains observed. This is consistent with animal research, showing that TDCS alone does not elicit long-term potentiation in the brain, unless it's paired with a second input to the motor cortex. In other words, you need to be doing something active, not just resting. In terms of adaptation, TDCS over the cerebellum led to faster initial adaptation to the perturbed environments, while M1 stimulation had no effect. So, overall, research using these basic laboratory tasks has shown beneficial effects of TDCS applied during practice. However, a deeper look reveals some important limitations. First, there are very large inconsistencies between the methods used in terms of location, magnitude, and duration of stimulation. This has resulted in effect sizes that range from trivial to large across studies without really any way of knowing which parameters will result in which outcomes. Second, very few of the effects have been replicated. Finally, there seems to be large inter-individual variability in the effects that is not well understood. In sum, the authors conclude, quote, a growing body of work continues to support the use of non-invasive brain stimulation as a tool for neuromodulation of motor learning. However, the larger literature has raised numerous and substantial caveats to be considered that are not trivial to resolve. More work is required to understand mechanisms underlying the effects of TDCS and substrates of inter-individual variability to optimize dosing and methodological designs. End quote. Before I consider the relevance of all of this to actual sports training, I want to tell you about the only study that I know of that has used brain stimulation with a sporting task. It was published by Zhu, Masters, and colleagues in 2015 with the goal of trying to use TDCS to promote more implicit learning in a golf putting task. This study was also a bit different than the other studies I've talked about so far because the stimulation was at a very different brain area. Specifically, TDCS was applied over the frontal cortex, an area called DLPFC, that is known to be involved in explicit verbal analysis of control. So, the idea was to use stimulation to reduce activity in this area. The experiment involved 27 college students that were split into a real and sham stimulation groups. Putts were made from 1.9 meters. The experiment was divided into a training phase, which was 7 blocks of 10 putts, followed by a test phase, which involved both a retention test and a transfer condition in which participants were required to complete a secondary task, counting the number of tones presented over a speaker, while putting. The prediction was that the real stimulation group would show better performance in the putting task, particularly in the dual task condition, because learning would be more implicit, freeing up cognitive resources to do more tone counting. What was found? During training, the real stimulation group holds significantly more putts than the sham group. However, this difference was not retained in the retention tests. As predicted, the real group did perform significantly better in the dual task transfer tests, holding on average about two more putts than the sham group. So, this study does provide some evidence that brain stimulation over the frontal cortex can induce more implicit learning. However, there's still some work to do to determine if it has any meaningful impact on performance in more realistic conditions. Okay, so what does all this mean for real-world sports training? Should you rush out tomorrow and buy a Halo Sport for all your athletes? Well, as we have seen, there is a lot of positive evidence to suggest that brain stimulation can have beneficial effects on motor learning. However, along with the methodological limitations I've already discussed, for me there are way too many caveats to conclude that will have any real effect on sports performance and is worth the investment. Let me go through each of these in turn. First, as usual, we have the major problem of drawing implications from research using simple, single degree of freedom motor tasks to the performance of the complex, multi-degree of freedom tasks that are involved in most sports. 
but I think this is particularly problematic here. As I've been discussing, the main brain area targeted for stimulation is the primary motor cortex, M1. As I think many will know, M1 is an area in which the basic movements of our body are controlled through an ordered set of neurons that represent each of our body parts, an arrangement commonly represented by the homunculus. The signals generated in M1 are modified by other brain areas, including the premotor cortex, supplementary motor area, parietal cortex, and the cerebellum, to produce highly coordinated movements. So, for me, it's not really surprising that stimulating the main motor control area, M1, has a big effect when you do a really simple movement. However, this is just a hunch, but I would expect its effect to become less and less when you look at more complex movements, because the other brain areas are becoming more and more important in modulating the signals. This leads to this second important point. To date, all of the motor learning studies looking at brain stimulation have involved non-experts typically university undergraduates. Whether TDCS will have any effect on experienced performers is still very open to question. For example, in the Zhu et al. studies, the stimulation led to complete novices making two more putts out of 10 from a distance of six feet. What would this translate to for an expert golfer? Maybe not very much. The third important issue is one that I've been hinting at throughout today's episode, the timing of the stimulation. If you recall, the guideline for Halo Sport is that the athlete should wear the device and receive the stimulation before physical training. But remember, there is actually no consistent evidence that stimulation before or during rest intervals has any effect at all. It only seems to work when the TDS is paired with activity in the motor cortex when the person is actually performing the task. And the effect of stimulation dissipates rather quickly. So why then does Halo suggest doing it before practice? Well, because for most sporting tasks, applying brain stimulation during practice would be completely impractical, with highly unpredictable effects. In studies we've talked about so far, participants are relatively still. The effects of moving around on brain stimulation are not understood at all. To quote Parkin and colleagues, there is to date no evidence that TDCS can even produce its classic excitatory or inhibitory effects in M1 in subjects who are moving during the application of the stimulation nor that in any significant replicated effect, the stimulation can benefit subjects beyond a few minutes. End quote. Therefore, you have to choose between ineffectual stimulation before practice or unpredictable stimulation during. The only exception to this might be for more endurance sports. For example, one could imagine a cyclist receiving stimulation while warming up on a stationary bike before a time trial. But again, these effects have not been well studied. Given these practical limitations combined with the lack of understanding about dosage and methodological parameters I discussed a few moments ago, when you pull everything together, the picture is pretty unclear and does not provide good support for the claims companies like Halo Neuroscience are making. Therefore, my personal recommendation would be to take a pass for now and invest time in more well-supported training techniques. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Chico.